What's happening everybody? Trey here, joined again by my dad Sean. And today at Reactions to the Classics, we're going to be throwing it back, looking at Pink Floyd's debut studio album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Going back to the Sid Barrett era, yeah. we've done their big four albums, I'd say, from uh, Dark Side through the wall. Really enjoyed those. It was nice to kind of get a little throwback here. It was. Got, got some good discussion points on this uh, psychedelic-infused record. And this is your first time stopping by the channel. We appreciate it. Here, reactions to the classics. We take a look back at some of the most classic albums of all time and do a detailed track-by-track -track review of them. So if that sounds like something interesting to you, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button and uh, we're just gonna get rocking with it in the quick facts. Trey, as you already mentioned, it's the debut studio album released in August of 1967. It's the only one made under the leadership of founding member Sid Barrett. It's number 347 on the Rolling Stones top 500 albums of all time. It was released in the U.S. with an altered track listing. It omitted three of the songs and included the U.K. non-album single, See Emily Play. Yeah, and they recorded this at EMI's Abbey Road Studios. They were actually there when the Beatles were recording Lovely yes. Rita. Utilized ADT, the automatic double tracking on Sid's voice. He was so quiet on his vocal tracks that he was placed in a separate yeah. uh, sound booth and they used a lot of reverb and echo on his voice and in the instrument to give it this unique psychedelic and few sound. Yeah, and the album's made up of two different types or classes of songs. One of them are lengthy improvisations that they use in their stage shows. And the other ones are very short studio tracks, so kind of an interesting dichotomy there. Barrett's drug use and LSD use in particular ramped up about halfway through the recording of this and they barely got through the album itself. He wrote eight of the songs, contributed to two of the instrumentals, and then Roger Waters has his first writing credit uh, on this album. Yeah, and the title, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, was taken from a book that Sid was reading, Kenneth Graham's The Wind and the Willows, which deals with a visionary encounter with the god Pan, yes. and that's kind of how the you know the album came. And you know you hear on Shine On You Crazy, Diamond Sid's referred to as the Piper. Yes. So it all kind of comes full circle, and then that'll just take us right into this album. We start off with Astronomy Domine. Yeah, and the lead vocal is by Barrett and keyboard player Richard Wright. Domine, which means Lord in Latin, is a word frequently used in Gregorian chants. Seen as their first foray into space rock tray, along with our track later on, Interstellar Overdrive. Opens with the voice of their then-manager Peter Jenner reading the names of plants, stars, galaxies through a megaphone, sounding kind of like an astronaut over an intercom. Yeah, that muffled voice that starts mm -hmm. off and the beeping really just sets the intrigue and the tone, I think, it of does. the entire record. You have your ears perked up because you this isn't the floyd we're used to hearing you know no. obviously later on we started at dark side in their mm -hmm. catalog and so i i enjoyed it for that you got an organ in here a descending riff that is unique so this song was perfect in what it set out to do and just set out uh, in the psychedelic nature of what the rest of the album was going to portray it takes us to Lucifer Sam. Yeah, and this is built again around a descending riff. We have a bowed bass and organ, again, giving it a unique flair and sound to it. I actually enjoyed this one more than the opener. Whenever you listen to this, I would highly recommend listening to it with headphones. Definitely. Probably more than any other album we've reviewed thus far. It, there was a unique studio trick where like the left ear would fluctuate and sound up and down, and it talks here about this literally this cat the Siamese cat and no one really understands him and I think that was apropos for Sid Barrett himself. This had a very 67 sound mm -hmm. to it a very door sound mm -hmm. to it. Organ on blast. Next up is Matilda Mother. This was sung by Wright with Barrett kind of joining in on the choruses and then Barrett sang the whole last verse. It's fragments of fairy tales uh, kind of a overriding theme with a lot of Barrett stuff is kind of the nostalgia for childhood and the fact that he could never get it back. Yeah, I thought that whenever Barrett came in, it, it brought a nice little punch to it. Yeah. The dichotomy between him and Wright's voice were, was 
you know, nice. And the song shifted quite a bit in style. So again, it, it kept you on the edge of your toes and it was intriguing throughout. And yeah, a lot of the lyrics just detail out that fantasy um, type of vibe mm-hmm. that yeah, just really was a huge theme throughout this entire record. And then takes Flaming kind of touches on a drug-infused fantasy-like mm-hmm. theme where a guy's up in the clouds and he's almost watching the world below him. Uh, he says, I'm so close, I might touch you, but I'm not going to. So again, adds to the confused nature to this song and a lot of, uh, you know, kind of some uneasiness throughout the entire record. Yes, third U.S. single release did not chart, but yet it's definitely a drug-inspired <laughs> uh, fantasy world that he takes us to. Next up is Power R Talk H, or Toke H, depending on whose interpretation you want to listen to. It's an instrumental with a little bit of a jazzy feel. The piano's kind of big on it. The meaning of it, who the heck knows at the end of the day. Yeah, but it's just an instrumental, so there aren't really lyrics at all. No. Like we have the just doi, doi, doi. Yeah, there's some throughout. weird stuff in um, there. I, I enjoyed the piano through the middle of the song. It kind of eased the listener, and then boom, we went into a harsher, more uh, intense instrumental backing. I didn't like it as much as the other instrumental on this record, Interstellar Overdrive, but still lots of unique beeps and almost like there's UFOs or something. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it was definitely interesting. Then that takes us into the water track, Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. It has some very odd, morbid kind of lyrics. Honestly, I wouldn't feel in this song at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is my least favorite song by far on here. I, this one actually grew on me through multiple listens. I thought that some of the better lyrics were here at the very end. A little bit relatable. He says, music seems to help the pain, seems to motivate the brain. And uh, at the very end, there, this didn't originate with Pink Floyd. I think it's kind of an ancient saying, but it's kind of neat. Realize, realize real lies so ah. when you have the the truth you, you're going to recognize all the the lies out there in the world so i thought that was a, a fun thing to ponder not my favorite track on here but it did grow on me and uh was a good way to end the beast and it probably helped uh waters oh kind yeah of, exactly you know in the future as we know what's <laughs> coming down the line a lot of this stuff including our next track that starts the b-side interstellar mm-hmm. overdrive uh it's obviously a very famous track, mm-hmm. but you can see how it influenced where we picked up, which oh, was yeah. on Dark Side, and how all of this stuff really influenced them way down the line, even though Sid was long gone out of the band. And Interstellar Overdrive is a near 10 minute instrumental track. This has probably the best use of stereo panning at the very end. It's crazy. You gotta put those headphones on. It kind of blows your mind the first time. Yeah, like it goes into a little fuzzy riff towards the end, hard rocking, and then it just goes into a crazy, like you are, I think, Interstellar Overdrive. Yeah, it's going buzzing in back and forth at warp speed. Yeah, um, it's been noted as one of the first space rock mm-hmm. type of tracks, and I, I think that fits fits a bell. The band kind of shied away from that, but for this song in particular, I think it does fit the bill. In uh, live, they would sometimes go up to thirty minutes with it. Yeah, exactly, and they were really known for it. There, they kind of alternated solos at the end in the live mm-hmm. show, and. They took it out soon after Sid left the band. They kind of wanted to go a different direction. But I will tell you this much, Trey. It takes testicular fortitude <laughs> to, to put an instrumental like oh, this yeah. on your debut album on the, to start a side where back then sequencing was such a big deal of what mm-hmm. you start in an album with. So I got to give him much props for that. Next up is the gnome. Barrett said he kind of just made it up off the top of his head when they were in the studio. It's about a, a gnome named Grimble Gromble. Um, <laughs> Going Tol- out in the grass. Just yeah, Tolkien uh, influences, not a surprise with The Hobbit and some other things. Uh, for me, it was fine. It's kind of a, it's kind of just a light, fun-loving oh, yeah. little thing after the uh, heavier Interstellar Overdrive. Mm-hmm. No, I, I'd agree with that. The vocal was more prominent here, the vocal track, yeah. so you could hear said a little bit more than a lot of the other tracks, and he starts to kind of whisper a little bit in that third verse. Kind of gives it that drug infused uh, <laughs> it does uh you know tinge to it and then we'll go into another track here chapter 24 the m- most philosophical of probably the um songs on here mm-hmm. existential because it's influenced by the i ching uh while my guitar gently weeps by george harrison was also influenced by this and uh th- people look at chapter 24 of it and they don't know if sid was 
going for, for another translation because there's not a lot of similarities between no, there's the not. two, but he, he must have, uh, you know, he had a reason song from it. Uh, a little bit more forgettable for me, just yeah, me in, the, too. in the grand scheme of things. Not a standout for me. And then uh, we go into the Scarecrow next. This first appeared as the B side of CM and we play about two months before this album was released. And in this song, Barrett is kind of uh, comparing himself to a scarecrow and the existence mm-hmm. of a scarecrow and kind of how he feels. Really introspective if you read the lyrics oh, and yeah. then understand the road that Sid was on at this time. Yeah, it's a shorter track, mm-hmm. but the, the lyrics just come at you. He notes that the scarecrow sadder than me, but the scarecrow was resigned to his fate and at the end of the day realizes that life's not unkind. So it just uh, that, that last verse really kind of packs, a, yeah. like you said, an introspective punch here so even if some people point oh Sid just talked about some you know fantasy yeah. childlike stuff there was a, a lot of I think kind of weight to his lyrics if you really dive into it and then we get into a, a crazy track the bike at the very end the very end um, our, our last song here and again it's very psychedelic infused probably one of the bigger ones on the entire record and here we have what I think probably a child who's the narrator just Mm -hmm. telling a a, a girl here you're the kind of girl that fits into my world I'll give you anything everything if you want things I thought that was the best course in the entire record they saved it for the end he says he has gingerbread men and that he's okay to just you know give away to this girl and then at the end there's a bunch of funky stuff oscillator sound effects almost like gears turning in an actual bike yeah i think that final section is obviously for us having knowledge of dark side a precursor of things to come Mm -hmm. and once again takes a lot of guts to put something like that in at the end the very last thing that people hear i dug that part a lot what were your favorite tracks i would have to say this song bike actually would be up there i enjoyed lucifer sam interstellar overdrive just for the craziness that it was involved to it wasn't like anything i really had ever heard what about you i'm gonna go with lucifer sam and the gnome and now we get to our overall grades Trey, for me i think as much as any album that we've looked at so far this is a time and place album and what i mean by that is if you were alive then and you were listening to this it probably blew your mind for us 50 plus years later i'm trying to put myself Mm -hmm. in that time and place i know a lot of it was a little you know kind of revolutionary there's a lot of people that drew inspiration from it and then it's odd because the floyd we know doesn't sound anything like Mm -hmm. this floyd but i do see where they were influenced from it so for that reason i'm going to give it a Mm 7.25 i don't dislike the album there's not a song on here that i go oh that's horrible it's just i probably need to listen to it a bunch i've listened to it a bunch but in a short amount of time so 725 for me yeah i i think you bring up a lot of great points I see a lot of this album and just further psychedelic yeah. music down the line as well as David Bowie said he was really influenced by Sid Barrett. I see some even in the 80s alternative so, uh, sonic use early records I think took some from this as well. And so Sid definitely though he was here for a short time yeah. in the music scape uh, left a big imprint. I'm going to be at an 825 on this with the caveat that it might even go higher like you. I, this one was a very tough album to rate just because it, was. it wasn't like anything really I'd ever heard before. Um, it was intriguing, and even though I wasn't on the same wavelength per se with it uh, at certain points in the record, I, I still wanted to keep listening to it. A lot of music today, and you know, even some back then, like you hear it once, you kind of have dug all the, yeah, all the nuggets. Heard, yeah, out exactly. Of it. it sounds but, much like other stuff at the time. Whereas this, uh, there, I think there's a lot of hidden, uh, you know, meetings and just sounds in there that you can unpack through multiple lists. And so I'm going to be at an eight to five there. Uh, it was definitely an interesting listen. Nice to go back to the early Floyd, and we'll just probably keep going in chronological yes, we will. order from here. Thanks, as always, Dad, for the research. Always a, a pleasure, especially on these first albums from yes. these major bands. And if you enjoyed what you saw today, guys, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button. We'll have more Floyd and various other artists from the time and many others up on the channel. And until next time, happy listening, and we will see you.